So uh, we are fresh and uh, can start in our next session. Uh, yesterday we had a really very good day, I think. We had a very interesting uh, topics, covered a lot of interesting uh, areas, catalysis and uh, characterization of catalysts. So I'm quite sure today we will go on uh, very interesting topics. But before we start with our first uh, speaker, I again would like to thank our uh, organizers, Lucier Oshi and uh, Eva. You did really a very good job yesterday and today, and I uh, really would like to thank you. Uh, I would like to ask Peter to take over the chair for the morning session. Please. Thank you, Jürgen. I'm Peter Smignot from Chemical and Materials Engineering Department at the University of Cincinnati. It is my pleasure to be here, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, sorry I missed uh, the day yesterday. I had the defense of one of my students and some health problems. Now I'm back, so I have the opportunity to be with you again. I would like to introduce uh, the first uh, paper of the day. The contribution is for Toria, uh, this plant's the noise. The speaker is uh, Dr. Robert uh, Rachford. And the title of the talk is Combinatorial Tools and Techniques for the Discovery, Optimization, and Commercialization of Heterogeneous Catalysts. It's a very nice and hot area, which can offer a lot today. So hopefully we'll enjoy a nice paper. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. I'm very excited about it. Um, please, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, ask. I have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. This morning, I'd like to talk to you about combinatorial chemistry. I'd like to cover a, a few different uh, topics. I'm sorry, we're talking about the microphone. How's that? Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, Toriel is a relatively new company, uh, less than one year old, so I'd like to give you a little bit of background as to who we are. Um, the pace of innovation, how quickly are we as scientists and engineers contributing to the advancement of society, to uh, industry, to academic progress? I'd like to discuss that, and the results might catch you by surprise. Uh, combinatorial chemistry for heterogeneous catalysis, that's the focus of our area. Um, it's the third wave of combinatorial chemistry applications behind pharmaceuticals and uh, homogeneous reactions. We'd like to show you some of the progress we've made in that area. Uh, catalyst discovery, the application of combi in the heterogeneous area, and PI242, the uh, first, we believe it is the first commercialized candidate uh, using combinatorial tools. And then looking at the challenge for the application of the technology in the future. Uh, UOP. UOP actually owns Toriel. We're a 100% uh, owned subsidiary of UOP. So I'd like to give you a little bit of background of them. Uh, 80, UOP is an 80-year uh, old company um, which has participated in the refining and petrochemical industry for the majority of its history. UOP has developed 30,000 patents, and annually we review these patents. And to my surprise, two-thirds of them are still enforceable. So this is not a company that has uh, a, a history of innovation 50 years ago and is riding the tail. There continues to be a tremendous amount of intellectual property generated by UOP. 70 different license processes in the refining and petrochemical and specialty chemicals areas. And 70 separate catalyst families that have been developed in support of those processes. UOP might be slightly um, unique in the industry in terms of a real emphasis and a real focus on having both the scientist and the engineer work side by side, understanding the process and the catalyst and optimizing them together. Molecular sieve absorbance is another large area of uh, focus for UOP. Back in 1988, UOP um, uh, got together with Union Carbide uh, and formed a new alliance to introduce more focus on uh, zeolites and molecular sieves. UOP is very strong in engineering, technology, training, and in fact, it's the chemical engineer working side by side with the, with the uh, PhD chemist who's really enabled this combinatorial chemistry methodology, and I'll show that to you in a few moments. Uh, and 30 engineered products. Um, UOP wants to convey you know, intellectual property to its clients. We can do that by designing a process, we can do that by giving them a catalyst, or by building a unique piece of equipment that can achieve a certain goal 
uh, higher, higher purity hydrogen, for example, through our PSA line, for example. Uh, and in fact, that expertise as well has contributed to the development of combinatorial chemistry and heterogeneous catalysis. UOP did not develop CombiChem or HECCAP by itself. It worked with Sintef. I'd like to give you a little bit of information about them as well. Uh, Sintef is an independent Norwegian research foundation. They're actually centered in Trondheim uh, in Norway, and the University of Trondheim and Sintef are co-located together. There are eight research institutes and four research companies. Sintef has just a broad uh, exposure to microsensors, informatics and software, uh, electronics, um, uh, chemistry research, materials research. So it's a very good development partner. They have 1,600 employees, 38% are PhDs, so a very strong technology house. It's my understanding that Dr. Um, Duncan Akparai, who is at Sintef, uh, obtained the first patent for the combinatorial um, production of zeolites. So they are a pioneer in uh, zeolitic synthesis using combinatorial methods. And now Toriel and Syntep are partnered together to drive combinatorial chemistry. Okay, so who are we and how, how we come together? Uh, UOP and Syntep started back in 1997 trying to change the pace of innovation, trying to increase the speed at which zeolites and catalysts can be created, uh, assayed, and tested in realistic conditions. The focus was scalable and predictable tools. Um, to digress a little bit, when you look at CombiChem, you want to do 100 experiments at a time or 1,000 experiments at a time. And the question is, which scale do you want? Some companies can do 1,000 experiments at a time. That's called primary screening. And it's very exciting. Um, the, the issue that some people have with primary screening is that you're taking atoms, per se, and put them on a silicon wafer and pass a feed over them. Uh, the question is, are those results predictive of commercial results? Are they scalable to something that's usable at a larger scale? There's some question in the industry about that. UOP and Syntef have chosen to focus on secondary screening, doing 100 catalysts at a time, 100 tests at a time, 100 synthesis at a time, at a larger scale that can give more predictive and more scalable results. Uh, and as a result, we feel that the first commercial candidate, the PI242 catalyst, a light paraffin isomerization catalyst, is now available in the industry, and we feel that's the first catalyst that has demonstrated that CombiChem technology can work. So UOP and Syntep developed this technology to do 100 experiments at a time, and they realized that perhaps other companies could utilize this technology. It's not just in the refining or the petrochemical area. So UOP and Syntep wanted to offer this to the, to the industry, but they felt that other companies would want to expose their R&D programs to UOP. So Toriel was created, and we're an intellectual property firewall. Toriel has access to all of the technology created by UOP and Syntef, but when we work with a client, none of the chemistry, none of the projects, none of the marketing information ever flows back to UOP, just as an aside. Okay, pace of innovation, why are we here? Back in 1997, um, UOP uh, did a marketing study and a review of its R&D program and put the two together. One of the pieces of information was this Chemtech study back in 1995, and it was very disturbing. The number of innovations for processes and for products or catalysts reaches an asymptote. UOP and others in the industry are pouring tremendous amounts of money into R&D. Academic institutions are pouring lots of money in research. And the question is, are we really improving uh, society? Are we really improving uh, industry? And UOP wasn't satisfied with the answer. So the question is, what could be done to improve the rate of uh, innovation? Uh, what step change in methodology technology approach could be utilized so that we could reinitiate the curves just like they were back in 1930 and really leap forward. And one of the candidates for uh, evaluation was combinatorial chemistry. More detail about CombiChem. Laboratory processes performed in parallel or with rapid serial techniques. Nirvana is to do everything in parallel, but it can be very expensive. So the question is, can you find the right combination of parallel processing but some very fast serial techniques to perhaps save on cost, capital cost, or manpower, but still get good results. If you take a look at the laboratories at uh, UOP and at Syntef, they're very highly robotic. Uh, robots are very good in terms of doing um, tedious tasks, uh, removing error, uh, and they're used for the basis, basic unit operations, weighing, liquid and powder dosing, et cetera. 
Um, parallel performance testing in miniature reactors. Again, uh, European Syntep have focused on secondary screening, uh, microgram quantities of catalyst rather than atomic deposition on wafers. So if you take a look at the uh, testing equipment that's been manufactured, it actually looks like a very small, a miniature micro reactor that could be scaled up into commercial size uh, units. The chemical engineers insisted that the reaction mechanisms and the reaction environment be uh, identifiable with commercial terms so that they can't, the results can be scalable and predictable. And we're very satisfied with the way the technology has turned mm -hmm. out. True diversity of variables. There are two ter terminologies that are used in the industry, high throughput and combinatorial. And you know, up until now, I haven't said a word about high throughput. I've been using combinatorial. In the next few slides, I'll show you that to do 100 of samples at a time is great. But if they're all at the same temperature, or if they're all at the same composition, or all at the same feed rate, that's not that interesting. So you, you, that's high throughput. To use combinatorial methods, where every single one of those 100 catalysts can be of a different composition, test at a different temperature, and add a different flow rate, that really frees the scientist to allow him to make progress and maximize his discovery. And again, operation in realistic conditions, that's something that we've emphasized from the beginning. So the benefits of combinatorial chemistry, Decrease cost of experiments and increase capacity for discovery and optimization. UOP has actually documented uh, a throughput increase or a productivity increase of 100 fold in its R&D laboratories. 10 times the experiments in one tenth the time. Um, when the uh, PhDs, uh, we have over, over 150 PhDs in UOP, when they first heard about that, they expected that 100 would get pink slips. We'd only need one or one and a half people. Of course, that's not the way to use it. Um, it is a threat, however. Some people look at combinatorial chemistry as, will they eliminate, can we downscale our new spending? That's completely wrong. And every time I have the chance to stand in front of people, I want you to reemphasize this. The challenge before us is not to reduce the spending in R&D, but to take that same R&D spending and maximize productivity, increase productivity <coughs> once uh, In the academic world, increase uh, understanding and improve the environment. In the industrial world, improve the environment and beat your competition. So I emphasize productivity on the positive side, not on the cost-cutting side. But it is very controversial. Traditional lab flow, uh, preparing a zeolite, preparing a catalyst, mixing, reaction, workup, screening, scale-up, mm -hmm. all the fun things that we all, all did and still do. But for a combinatorial workflow, if I can do 100 times the number of experiments, 10 times the number of experiments in one tenth the time, I can look at a much wider range of variables. I can look at a much broader experimental space, and I can improve the rate of innovation and improve the technology that I'm working on. And this is where the concept of monkey science comes up, if you'll excuse me for using that expression. Some people criticize CombiChem by saying, I don't have to understand my chemistry anymore. I'm bound to find something that works there, because look at all the number of experiments I can do. That's another aspect of CombiChem that I don't necessarily, or another criticism that I don't necessarily agree with. If I'm a scientist and I understand my chemistry and I can do that many more experiments, I have a much better chance of fully understanding the chemistry and fully reaching my goal. And in fact, the PI242 example is very clear, and I'll get into a lot more detail on that. That's a typo, and I apologize. It's not reduction in variables, but it's reduction of variability. By using highly automated labs, we've really cut down on the variability of experiment to experiment in the use of robots and the use of combinatorial chemistry. Um, in the PI242 example, I'll show you, one of our scientists worked for three years to find a new uh, light paraffin isomerization catalyst. Trying to compare those experiments over three years is very difficult. Human error, different operators, different reagents. If you can increase the speed of your research, and, and by having 100 experiments or 50 experiments at a time, you can actually use controls in every set of experiments. You can really improve your data comparison and your data analysis techniques. So use of um, Robots to speed things up, to get more done, uh, gives you a lot of benefits. And experimentation beyond prejudices. On the left is a, is a standard uh, diagram uh, showing that a scientist has chosen 10 different points to experiment on producing a new compound. If he now, if that same scientist now has access to combi tools and combi methods and has 100 times the productivity, he can now go beyond his prejudice of saying, well, I'll just cover some of the spots even." I will really thoroughly investigate the experimental space and truly understand what's happening 
in my chemistry. And I can uh, do duplicates to validate that my equipment is working well. It's, it really enables the scientist. So again, here's a brief, a brief uh, comparison between high throughput and combinatorial. Uh, if you look at the unit operations that you perform, high throughput um, is good, but it doesn't give you a lot of diversity. 100 experiments at one temperature, then another 100 at another temperature. However, if you design equipment um, and methods and tools that allow you to change temperature, pressure, composition, feed rate for each individual sample, the number of experiments, the amount of work you can do, increases exponentially. And that's Toriel's philosophy based on the work that UOP and CENTEF have achieved. But it is a mixture. It's the combinatorial approach, uh, having a wide variation of all of these variables. But you still need high throughput methods in order to get the samples through the system. And together, um, that is the, the mechanism that has been developed by UOP and CENTEF. I'm talking a lot about a scientist wanting to do uh, 100 times the experiments, 10 times the experiments in one tenth of the time. When I go to talk to a lot of acad uh, academics and a lot of scientists in industry, I've actually heard this, this is a quote, I can't think of 100 more experiments I want to do. And, and it might sound silly, but in reality, a scientist has been focusing on one area for so long. Why has he been focusing on that area? Well, that's where literature tells him to go. That's where he spent his career. And he hasn't had the time or the resources to go outside of that area. So he says, this is my experimental space. I don't need 100 experiments. That's ludicrous. Well, if you think about it, if you have the opportunity to have higher throughput, to have combinatorial approaches, you can take a chance and go outside of those areas. And in fact, if you look at the variables in cattle's development, and on this side, I should slide. I show you synthesis <coughs> variables. And on the next one, I'll show you some uh, process variables. It's unbelievable the number of experiments that you really could do if you were given the opportunity. And should you take a chance and go into these other experimental spaces? In catalyst development, there's composition, synthesis, finishing, activation, process reactivation. All those categories of concepts that you have to look at to make a catalyst system work. Uh, for synthesis, it's the order of reagent addition, treatment, et cetera, et cetera. In treatments, uh, what, what atmosphere do you use? What temperature, what flow rate? And is it a static system, a flow-through system, plant? The number of variables is unbelievable. And if you show a scientist this and, and give him access to um, higher throughput methods and combinatorial methods, he can take advantage of these. <coughs> Same thing with activation. Uh, just looking at the atmosphere, is it inert, oxidizing, reducing? The number of variables is tremendous. And can you enable your scientist in the lab, in, academ in academia, in industry, uh, to do more, uh, to go farther into the design of experiments and, and produce more results. It's even more important when you consider that the um, process variables affect the way that you rank catalysts. And this is obvious, so forgive me for showing this, but um, if you look at two catalysts, catalyst systems A and B, at two different process conditions, they perform very differently. Which catalyst is best? Again, if a scientist only has the opportunity to do a few different experiments, he might come to one conclusion, allow him to look at the broader space. He could come to a completely different conclusion, a breakthrough view, improving the pace of innovation. So that's what we've tried to do, provide methods and tools to enable scientists. So now let me show you a concrete example, because all I've done right now is talk in hypotheticals from your point of view. The PI242 catalyst, it's a low pressure paraffin isomerization catalyst. Mm -hmm. In traditional refining, uh, light paraffins are produced, and they're terrible. Very low octane, very high vapor pressure. They are um, worthless, if you will, in the refining model. Um, to take that, uh, those light paraffins, isomerize them, uh, increase their octane number, lower their read vapor pressure, very significant. Lots of money is generated in the refinery using that methodology. Uh, I will now show you the work of Dr. Ralph Gillespie, who some of you may know at UOP. Uh, in three years, he developed 271 catalysts. His goal was to find a catalyst formulation that would improve the target octane of the light paraffin isomerate by one half an octane. And he failed. He's one of our best scientists. He invented the majority of the line, and he wasn't able to achieve his goal. Ralph, Dr. Gillespie, the same scientist, was then given access to the combinatorial chemistry tools that were invented at UOP and Syntec. He used them in five weeks. 
He developed 512 catalysts in those five weeks and had three hits, three leads. Same scientist, same knowledge, different tools, remarkable different results. Not only that, but then we asked Dr. Gillespie to go ahead and stay with that catalyst, not only through discovery, but all the way through commercialization. And here he surprised us. He asked to continue to use the combinatorial chemistry tools. He said, well, if I discovered this catalyst, why can't I optimize it from a performance point of view, from a manufacturing point of view, using these same tools? I want to do 48 experiments or 100 experiments a day. And he did, and he finished it in 15 months. Typically, at ULP, it's five to seven years to take a catalyst from discovery to commercialization. So this was just a tremendous eye-opener and a real validation that combinatorial chemistry can improve the pace of innovation in your industry. Um, and uh, the catalyst is now being offered for sale. Uh, we validated it at commercial operating conditions and in commercial uh, production runs at our manufacturing facilities. We're very pleased with it. If you take a look at the 512 experiments that Dr. Gillespie did, there's really not a large number of variables that were introduced to make 512 experiments. Very few components had to be put together in order to come up with such a broad diversity in terms of experimental design. So someone went up to Dr. Gillespie and said, why were you able to discover this now? What did counter chemistry do? Did you get lucky or what? And his answer was immediate and very eye-opening. He said, I was wrong. I had a theory as to how my catalyst worked. And I continue to do experiments in this area to prove or disprove why my catalyst worked in a certain way. And it turns out that was a local maximum, but not a global maximum. I had a hunch that maybe there was an area outside of the design of experiment, that maybe there'd be something interesting. But I could never sit there and divert my resources. I had so precious few resources. So using CombiChem, I took a chance, I migrated over, and I found the global maximum. And I was able to shift my theories. He was very open, but very pleased. Here's the actual data from all of the experiments that were performed, weight hourly space velocity versus yield. This is the reference band for the commercial catalyst and the 95% confidence interval. Inter, interval. Uh, please excuse this data. This is very old. Uh, I'm not allowed to show anything more recent. But it shows a wide uh, reference band. The confidence interval is now, now much narrower based on the amount of data that has been obtained. And look at the tremendous number of hits well above the reference band. Uh, showing that there were areas of interest, leads generated from his work. But who cares? You develop something at the microgram scale, is it predictable? Is it scalable? Can you truly utilize it in a commercial environment? So we then took those three different, three of those leads, three of those catalyst formulations, out of the combinatorial chemistry reactors and put them in the traditional pilot plants. In ULP and Syntaf and Toril's view, CombiChem does not replace the pilot plant. It is an additional tool for the scientists. So those formulations were placed in the pilot plants and comparing a figure of merit against temperature, sure enough, all three leads significantly improved and outperformed the traditional commercial catalyst. In fact, if you remember I mentioned Dr. Gillespie's target was a 0.5, a half octane increase. These catalysts are three to four octane numbers high than he was able to exceed his target by a factor of six to eight. Just a complete shift in his paradigm. But again, Dr. Gillespie said, but my theory was wrong. So now I really don't understand what was happening for the catalysis system. I want to go back and model it. Well, he now had a tremendous number of data points that he could actually feed back into algorithms and programs and develop new models that explained what was happening. And he has developed a new theory, and he's published on that. So uh, he was able to find something in an area that he had suspected but never had a chance to investigate, uh, able to bring it to the commercial arena, and able to go back and model it to fully understand the system. <coughs> so it's the ability to generate a tremendous amount of information and feed back into the scientists. In fact, something I haven't mentioned, um, the amount of data that is generated when you do 50 or 100 experiments a day is just overwhelming, it's crushing. So informatics, uh, software that helps the scientists design the experiment, 
check the quality of his experiment, analyze the information, and cycle back into models. The informatics arena has been very active for the industry. Uh, UOP and Syntap, a company called NDI, have worked together on informatics. And in fact, UOP received a $25 million grant from the ATP uh, in order to develop informatics in support of the software. Uh, just more information, when we go, when UOP goes to show PI242 to clients, um, they show the uh, tremendous increase and improvement in the performance of PI242 compared to the LPI100, which is the commercial catalyst. In fact, uh, this new formulation is encroaching upon um, uh, sulfur intolerant species. In the green are commercial catalysts that are poisoned by sulfur. In the red, commercial catalysts that are tolerant of sulfur. We're actually moving up and starting to show that a uh, easier to handle catalyst, a less sensitive catalyst, can produce some of the highest yields. But again, it certainly beats the previous LPI 100 by three to four octane. Okay, uh, the challenge that we have before us. This is a very interesting um, uh, chart or study that comes from Standard & Poor's. And it shows R&D productivity in terms of if you increase your R&D spending on the y-axis, is there a sales percentage? And you'll excuse me, but I, I grabbed this data from industry. Uh, is there a, a change in the sales? In other words, if you're doing uh, changes in R&D, if you're spending money in R&D, are you making a return on it? The size of the bubble is the relative spending in different industries. And you look at the chemical areas and the materials areas. 6.8 and 8.4 billion dollars worth of R&D spent. Uh, and for every 5% increase in R&D, there's a zero or maybe even a little bit of a loss <laughs> in terms of sales. And that's commoditization of the chemicals and materials industries. Something that we all know is happening, but here's the data to show it. It's commoditization. Are there any step changes? Are there any improvements in which it, that are being realized by industry where they can capture more value? And the answer, as of, the, as of this uh, graph, is no. But if you use combinatorial chemistry, can you develop uh, step changes in performance, new products, new processes, new catalysts that would give you a positive return on investment for every R&D dollar spent? Um, the R&D budgets in our industry have been under tremendous pressure over the last few years to introduce new tools, to generate more value for the R&D dollar, I think would go a long way in supporting what we're all very interested in. So that's the challenge that we have before us. Uh, so thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, talk in front of you. I very much appreciate it. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Paper is open for questions. Any questions? Good evening. Yeah. Uh, turnover time uh, in uh, development is, is one issue. The other issue, of course, cost. Uh, you have developed one uh, catalyst uh, successfully, the uh, uh, PI-242. Can you share any information uh, with us? What, what, what's overall the cost to develop that, that special type of catalyst? Excellent question. The question is, uh, throughput and the speed of commercialization and speed of experimentation is important but what's the cost associated with it? Because there's a 100-fold increase in productivity, 10 times the experiments in one tenth of time, the cost actually goes down. Um, for a um, hydrocracking test, a heavy oil test, uh, companies estimate that it's about $1,500 to run an experiment. Using combinatorial chemistry, the cost is $75. So from $1,500 down to $75, a 20, 20, a 120th the cost. Not 100th, because combinatorial chemistry is, is more expensive of a technique, but there's a significant cost savings on a per experiment basis. But uh, when I recall the numbers, right, you, you tested 500 and a little bit catalysts, so you have to... Correct, and that's right. You have the ability to test more catalysts. It's cheaper per catalyst, but because you're testing more, right. the R&D budget for a specific project might need to be larger than it used to be. But you'll also notice this project only went five weeks instead of going three years. So you do have to strike the right balance in terms of what budget you can allocate. But the ability to go through those 500 catalysts in, in only a small number of weeks, um, it, it certainly was a lower cost development program overall. There's, there's no question about that. 
have plenty of time for questions. Yes, sir. Um, would you care to comment on the IT situation surrounding this area? As you know, civics has been very aggressive um, with regard to patenting new methods of combinatorial screening. Right. How do you stand in relation to that? Very good. The question is for intellectual property, uh, CIMIX, uh, HTE, and Avantium, they're all actually very um, active right now. Um, what is the overall status? Uh, UOP and Syntef and Toriel all make the same statement that they would never infringe on another party's valid patent. Uh, with that being said, uh, it's very true that there's a large number of companies right now uh, who have stated publicly that they're practicing combinatorial chemistry techniques. Um, ExxonMobil, Dow, DuPont, Honeywell, UOP. Uh, so uh, people are recognizing the value of combinatorial chemistry and are producing results. I'll make one other comment. Toriel is actually very fortunate. Uh, Toriel can either sell equipment into the, uh, into a client that can do combinatorial chemistry, or we can perform combinatorial chemistry experiments using our own equipment. And our equipment is located in Norway at Sinta. There are no patents on combinatorial chemistry in Norway. Uh, and the patent situation is very different in terms of equipment versus performing the research in the United States. So we feel there are plenty of avenues whereby companies and academic institutions can engage in combinatorial chemistry research. Very good question. Gentlemen, I have another IP question. At what point is this considered a reduction in practice? When you make it a, when you do 512 experiments and one of them works, at that point can you write a patent and submit it to the patent office? Or do you have to go even further in the process? And I can picture people just running experiments and filing for patents and really hindering hindering process that way. Uh, excellent question. Um, and in fact, I apologize. I meant to bring this up. Uh, intellectual property is, is tremendously important nowadays. And I opened up my discussion by saying UOP has 30,000 patents, two thirds of which are still enforceable. So that's very much in our forefront. The patent office has actually complemented UOP in recent years. Uh, almost months, in terms of the improved quality of the patents that we've been requesting, that they've been able to grant, because of the increase in data that, that we have been able to show. To just run the experiments uh, in the lab, is that really a reduction of practice? In, in view of the patent office, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. But my point here is, the quality of the patent has gone up, and the breadth and depth of the patent, the area that a company can get intellectual property coverage for, is greatly enhanced because of the number of data points. So is this a hindrance? Well, if a company actually does the work, invents a new cattle system, and does the work to, to research and protect a certain area, and the patent office grants that patent, I think that's good. I think that's someone adding value. Uh, if the patent office grants a bad patent, well then it's wrong, of course. But the answer to your question is the patent office has recognized the value of data that supports the theory embodied in the invention. Uh, can the technology be successfully and efficiently used in homogeneous catalysis and pharmaceutical and uh, organic synthesis? However, for uh, heterogeneous uh, catalysis, it is still a challenge because although catalyst synthesis is no, no part, but uh, in catalysis, the testing is a rate limiting process. You can produce hundred product uh, catalyst sample, but you cannot test fit the test. Can you share some information about uh, your reactor library design? Because many people design different uh, reactor uh, design, but no no one has very successful uh, satisfied design. Can you share this information? Very good. The question is uh, in um, uh, heterogeneous catalysis. The difficulty has been in the testing. Uh, again, combinatorial chemistry has been used heavily in pharmaceuticals and in homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysis. <coughs> you can make lots of samples, but how do you test them? Uh, and can I share some information on that? Um, I wasn't able to bring any pictures with me today um, in, in this forum, but I can share with you that in order to test a heterogeneous cata catalyst, you have to do it at what we consider to be realistic conditions. High pressures, high temperatures, uh, realistic space velocities, and again, our philosophy of combi chem different space velocities in each reactor, different temperatures, different pressures. The uh, UOP has been awarded a patent for a, a microreactor that can handle uh, microgram quantities. Uh, and it actually looks like a flow-through reactor, a plug-flow reactor. Um, uh, 
we have uh, feed preparation, individual control of feed rates and temperatures, and a wide variety of, of analysis on the back end of the reactor, uh, GCs, IR, uh, NMR, uh, mass spec. It is a, um, not NMR, I didn't mean to say that, mass spec. Um, it is truly a, uh, a scaled down version of a flow through reactor system from beginning to end. Um, and hopefully I can share some, some additional information for you at some other time. Yes, um, you, you talked about uh, your ISOM, isomerization catalyst. Uh, what types of catalyst synthesis can you perform combinatorial? There's zeolite synthesis, impregnation, precipitation. <coughs> right. Uh, the question is what kind of, of zeolite or uh, material synthesis can we do using these techniques that were developed? Uh, zeolites, mixed metal, os uh, mixed metal oxides, um, I always say this wrong, I apologize. Perverskovites, not peroscovites, peroscovites. Yes. Um, uh, one of the reasons why UOP and Syntef uh, wanted to migrate this technology out tutorial was the fact that we believe that they are, uh, the, the tools and methods uh, applicable are, are utilized and can be utilized in other fields outside of traditional refining and, chemical and petrochemical areas. Including there's been some interest in this area for materials for fuel cells and also for materials for um, energy systems for batteries, etc. cetera. The yes. second question is that, you know, uh, based on TI or two catalysts, that your efficiency is uh, at least 50 times than the conventional catalyst development uh, speed. So uh, based on this uh, data, you suppose you have 30 employees in your, your, in your company. So your efficiency should be equal to 1,500 uh, employees. So can you comment when powder can replace your OP? That's very good. Um, I didn't realize my boss was in the room, but my boss says the same thing. If I've got 30 employees at Toriel, and we roughly have 30 employees between Toriel, UOP, and Syntep working on this, and I've got a 100 time productivity increase, uh, I should be about the size of UOP scientists. Why, when am I going to surpass UOP? And that's very good, because my boss asks me that all the time. Uh, in fact, uh, I say that number with a straight face, we have documented, UOP has documented a 100-fold productivity increase using these tools. So your assumptions are, some, are kind of tongue-in-cheek, but they're kind of not. There are tremendous uh, targets now at UOP and other companies that are implementing CombiChem in terms of the improvement and the rate of innovation that should be achieved using these tools. Toriel, I should state, uh, our mission is not to pick a catalyst and develop it ourselves and then hand it to industry. Our mission is to convey the tools and the methods to the industry to allow them to do the research. And we can do that either by selling equipment and teaching the tools or by doing the research for you at our labs in Norway. But we're not doing our own projects. We're always doing clients' projects. I have two questions. Yes. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you for your excellent talk. You. I have to confess and say that I was not a believer two years ago. But slowly, uh, I transform myself to a believer, and your talk was uh, helpful to me. I have two simple questions. Uh, the one, the first one, is more philosophical or ethical type of uh, question. It seems to me you are preparing a, a nuclear weapon right now. You have something that can perform a very good, very fast, very large number of experiments, and it seems to me uh, the companies that will engage first somehow they will get everything under their name including what's done in the past, what's going to happen in the next 10 years. And somehow we're going to have some sort of um, people monopolizing the area. So I feel that somehow transform ourselves to some sort of uh, Bill Gates situation. There is one company that clean up the entire market. Uh, they have their name on their patent, and that's about it. What do you feel about this? Um, those comments really hit home for me. Uh, I have been in several conferences where Simix, who was brought up before, has spoken. And Simix, uh, as, as was commented before, has been awarded several patents on the basic research using CombiChem tools. And um, academics, industrialists stand up and are just vehemently angry at Simix for trying to patent the concept of basic research. I, excuse me, I personally am offended by that as well. You can't tie the hands of the researcher. That doesn't make any sense for society or for industry or for academia. Your comments about if I have a nuclear weapon, if I have combi chem, 
is someone going to be able to, to corner the market? My answer is, I honestly don't believe so. Because you have large companies, uh, Sue Kimi, Exxon Mobil, DuPont, they have scientists in a known area of expertise, but more importantly, they have a market niche. They understand feedstock, marketing, distribution channels, etc. So someone being given CombiChem, they might be able to invent a, a catalyst in a new area, but then to be able to move their entire marketing area and take over that, I don't see that as happening. I do see that within a given area, if you look at competitors side by side, if one or two of those competitors engages in CombiChem, they have a significant advantage over the third. So I do believe this is a paradigm shift, but I think those competitions still remain within defined market niches. My, my second question uh, is a simple question related more to catalysis. Um, let's say that with this uh, very fast uh, experimentation, you miss uh, something important from the point of view of scale up. In your lab, it doesn't look important, forget it. But uh, somehow, if you scale up uh, uh, the process, these conditions, you may have something successful. Is there any chance uh, for this to happen? A absolutely. Um, How do you fight that? Right. Combinatorial chemistry is not a substitute for scale up. It does not replace pilot plants. It is an additional tool in the PhD's tool belt. Um, we believe that the scientists will have a better understanding of the system. But scale up is very tricky. We feel you still have to go through the pilot plant. Um, Fortunately, though, and, and Dr. Gillespie proved this for us, if you did miss something, if there's something that isn't optimized, you can come back and still use the Kami tools to try to correct it and reduce the cycle time to scale. How do you know? My question is that the uh, combinatorial didn't show you any hints that this, this can be good, but uh, for some reason, this can be good when you scale up. Oh, yours so, is the negative. I see. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Um, well, the, the, the question is... You have no hint that this will be good. Right. If, if I accept your, your comment as an axiom, then I have failed because I produce tools and methods at the combinatorial scale that weren't predictive and scalable. Because your theory is I've done experiments and I show no hint of a lead, and yet it is commercially viable. Um, I, I can tell you that if that's the case, I failed. The entire theory behind producing these methods and tools was that they would be scalable. It's the same process conditions. It's realistic quantities of catalysts. Uh, it's truly a, 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 a catalyst, a noble metal supported on, on, a, on a zeolite, for example, in one specific system, as opposed to depositing the noble metal on a silicon wafer. So I think I've minimized the chance of that happening, but if what you say happens is true, uh, I have failed. I have plenty of time for more questions. Yes, sir. I kind of want to ask the same question, but the opposite. Can you give us an example of where you had a hit combinatorial methods, but it did not work when you scaled it up. What were the reasons as to why you got a false positive? The one example that I'm familiar with uh, is a chlorided system. And uh, to try to model uh, chloride steady state in a, in a commercial reactor is very difficult, right? Chloride level on a mobile canvas. Uh, in the um, uh, heterogeneous system, the combi scale, we believe that we were able to model it correctly. That is to say, we did our best in trying to model it. When we took it to the uh, pilot plant area, which was a larger scale and even more commercially suitable environment to try to maintain that chloride water mix, it proved that we weren't as, um, the, the results weren't as significant as we had predicted. The system still performed well, but, it, but the delta no longer exceeded our target for commercialization. So we did have a lead. It was statistically significant, but by the time you went to the next step, the pilot plant, that statistical significance dropped below our horizon, so we did not try to commercialize. We still feel the tool is valuable, and we still felt the need for the pilot plant in that chain. But yes, we have, uh, we have had that exact experience. CombiChem is not the panacea, it is another tool. Quick question regarding the use of combinatorial chemistry mimicking the way it's been used in biology. Um, in biology, the tests for efficacy were incredibly important, but now they're trying to use it for things like toxicity. So just like in the catalyst world, you have activity that's far from the whole Correct. story. Do you have any plans to try to test for aging, uh, resistance, poisons, things like that? And how do you mimic aging on a combinatorial scale? Right. Um, uh, outstanding question. 
the answer is yes. The tools are currently in use on aging studies and poisoning studies at UOP and Syntec. Um, keep in mind now that for traditional catalysts in industrial settings, uh, catalyst life is two years, maybe one year, maybe six months. And scientists rarely can use a pilot plant for that long. So I would pose to you that many institutions, both private and public, have uh, advanced aging techniques where they can mimic aging. To scale those down to combi is actually relatively straightforward if you consider the combi method is still a micro-reactor, right? Uh, so the analogy is there and it's been very successful. Uh, I'll take your question a step further. Not only can you use it for catalyst aging and for poisoning, but for manufacturing optimization. The first PI242 um, formula that went to our manufacturing, to UOP's manufacturing, I'm sorry, I worked for UOP for 17 years, so I'll keep slipping. Um, that went to UOP's manufacturing facility was very expensive and very difficult to make. So again, they went back to Dr. Gillespie and said, can you optimize the formula, still make uh, your, your commercialization target of, of, of three or four octane number improvement, but make it easier to manufacture? He significantly changed one of the feedstocks, one of the products, and some of the manufacturing conditions, and really improved the recipe. So that's another application of CombiChem over and above what's my highest yield or what's my highest octane. Very powerful tools. It's, it's been a, a very much of an eye opener for you will do. Yes. Having come in USA, you have a different perspective. Uh, you say the cost per experiment is going down. Can that really go down if you put the lab in the US to be a micro reactor? The cost per experiment? Or if it's actually going up? The, the I'm, I'm not interested in making 100 experiments. Right. I'm making one experiment. Right. The question is, can you really uh, reduce the cost of an experiment if you're in an academic lab and you're just trying to reduce the cost of experiment? My answer to you is yes. If you run just one experiment, I can't help. But if you were going to run 48 or, uh, or 50 or 100 experiments in total, then it is cheaper to do than combinatorial. Uh, it's, it's smaller quantities. It's more but accurate. The university is never going to set up a lab for doing 40 experiments. They are cheap grad students. We are going to do in six months. In that instance where manpower is, uh, is inexpensive, uh, it's a challenge. The only question then is, is there value in terms of the rate of your gener prop uh, generation of intellectual property, of finding new discoveries? If that has any value to you, then CombiChem is useful. If it doesn't have any value, well, then you've negated both drivers, cost of doing experiments and time to do experiments. Let me add a comment on this. Academia has a different purpose. You're supposed to train people, so let them walk in the lab forever. Right. <laughs> no, these people are industrial because they to make uh, money real fast. But I do feel that somehow you run very fast uh, ahead of everybody else with this tool. Which is the way of industry. Uh, yeah, one, one, one customer. Uh, high throughput or combinatorial methods are based on at least a number of experiments, as you mentioned, 50 or 100 or whatever. Are there, or what, what uh, I'm aware of, there, there are strategies, uh, yeah. Uh, offered based on evolution theory or so, to come back down to, to reduce the number of, of experiments. Could you comment on that? Absolutely. And this gets back to the monkey science. Do I need to do 100 experiments if I either understand my chemistry or if I have good um, um, an an algorithms to reduce the number of experiments? Do I need that many experiments? And I always um, uh, pose the question. If you're really an expert in your area, which you very well are, very well could be, and if you do have good uh, uh, um, algorithms to reduce the number of experiments that you need to perform, by introducing these tools that can do more experiments, faster and cheaper, and more reproducibly, haven't you improved the quality of that fewer number of experiments? So I'm not proposing this tool because you have to do so many experiments. We're proposing this tool that no matter how many experiments you have to do, you can always do them faster and less expensive and with higher quality because of the reproducibility and the number of, re of uh, checks and reference samples in each test using these tools. So I do not dispel the concept of I don't need to do 100 experiments or I don't need to do 1,000. I'm saying you can always improve the quality of those experiments that you need to do. Yes, sir. To follow up on the comment, though, is um, going through uh, generation of experiments, to, to do your informatics uh, uh, use some algorithm to predict the next rather than have the scientist pull it out? Do, does the uh, tutorial uh, informatics actually uh, do the generational prediction? So you set up the first experiment.
experiment, you run those, and then it predicts the net, what the next experiment, the next experiment. Really right. The, the, the question is, has the informatics utilized by UOP and, and Syntaf and Toriel and NDI, does it take the scientist out of the loop? Does it predict the next set of experiments based on data? And the answer is absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, the, the tools help the scientist analyze, help them predict, help them build models, but it is the scientist who must invent and must feed it back. To be honest, there are some companies who are going that way, and I'm really resisting going that way. Uh, I just do not think there is any substitute for the scientist and his innovation and creativity. I might be proven wrong, and I might be the next paradigm that gets wiped out. But uh, for right now, um, it's the scientist who feeds it back to him. Yes, sir. Um, uh, I was wondering, um, you stressed uh, many times how important it is that we understand what material you're looking at. If you can develop tools and methods that can produce more of those in a shorter amount of time and then analyze them either for physical characteristics or the reaction performance in a reaction chemistry, um, then you have more data flowing to you whereby you can explain local minima, local maxima, global maxima. And in fact, that's what happened on PI242. We've been hunting around the local maxima, not the global maxima. So I do think that anytime you can develop tools to uh, process, to create, and to analyze whatever material you're looking at faster, uh, with more accuracy, I think it's an advantage. Uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, I, uh, I think that that is the combi chemistry probably not uh, universally applied to any problem in the heterogeneous catalysis. Uh, can you give us some advice, uh, precautions, that we, before we use this technology, uh, which area are actually most suitable for this uh, technology? And, uh, and uh, is there any, uh, any precautions uh, before we put money that uh, we need to think about? Excellent question. Um, again, going back to CombiChem, it, it is not a panacea. Uh, it, it hasn't been fully accepted or adopted by the industry. Where should it be applied first? The, the equipment associated with CombiChem can be purchased, but it's very expensive, multi-million dollars, right? And what company is going to invest in a multi-million dollar piece of equipment before proving <laughs> that it works in their specific chemistry? So we've taken a different approach. Rather than me saying I have a list of where it should be applied or not, I don't have that knowledge. But what I do have is an approach. I would suggest that a company would engage in a small study in CombiChem. Take a look at an area of interest for you, a one or two month study, a very inexpensive study, to see if the synthesis tools, the characterization tools, and the testing tools apply to your chemistry. If they do, wonderful. If they don't, <coughs> the technology isn't ready. And then either try to develop that technology on your own or with someone else to do it. So I agree with you completely. It is not applicable to everyone's chemistry, and you should be cautious in evaluating what is available in the industry and applying it in small studies to see if it works for your chemistry. Uh, just uh, probably a bit of a follow-up. Uh, we approach you and I say that we have a such a problem. This is uh, something we're trying to do. Can you give us some uh, free warning and free advice? Uh, maybe that's not a good idea, but maybe that's a good idea. What's kind of advice? <laughs> you think you do this or you say this stuff? We just try. We we'll see what happens. Okay. Right. Excellent question. Um, a client, a, 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 a company in industry has a problem, and they want to see if combinatorial chemistry tools are applicable. Uh, you would approach the scientists at Toril and at Syntec. Um, and if you requested, UOP could be brought in too, but as a default, UOP is kept down. So the first question on the table is, is there any common knowledge between the scientists at the client and at Toriel and at Syntec? Um, maybe, maybe not. If the client is paying for the study, the client decides where the test goes. The, the chemists and the PhDs and the engineers at Syntec and Toriel can always comment from a mechanical point of view, from a methodology point of view, are those right experiments or not? For example, many clients, when they're presented the opportunity to do 50 or 100 experiments a day, it, it's hard for them to think in terms of so much variety, changing the temperature and pressure of every catalyst. So to help with the way to do the experiment, advice is always available from Toril and from Syntec. In terms of advice of, well, if I want to go from propane to a nitrile instead of propylene to a nitrile, what catalyst formulation should I test? Um, the odds of us having that chemistry expertise are very low. But in theory, the client has that expertise, the client has an area of interest, and then together, using that client's chemistry knowledge and Toril and Syntest methodology and tool knowledge, 
you can find a path to success. Yes, sir. I have a more of a philosophical IP kind of a question. Uh, human Genome Project became very successful and it became public domain. Uh, X-ray diffraction files, there are thousands of files coming out because everybody's crystallographers are doing different proteins every day. Are you guys going to give results which are not successful? and let people, other people learn. Keep the hits for your IP rights, but direct other people from not doing wrong paths. Excellent question. Uh, for that, for those data that are generated that don't have IP value per se, can they be put into the public domain? Because of the business model, the way that I have set up Torio, uh, I'm not doing research on my own. The only research that I'm doing is for UOP, they're a client of mine, and for other uh, industrial um, uh, clients, if you will. And this is actually a very big difference between Simix and Torio. Simix, when they do research for a company, Simix owns the intellectual property, and they license it back to the client. So your question is very applicable to them. Torio doesn't believe in that model at all. Always the client owns all of the intellectual property. There's no reason for Torio to own it. So it's not my data to give. So I'm sorry I can't specifically answer your question, but I do see your point. I do. Thanks, I think we have a lot of time and we bombed you with questions, but you're doing great. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I got this question from what uh, Uzi started. Given your opinion about two important issues, uh, what is the future of combinatorial in terms of very uh, non-conventional reactors like we all understand, some like microchip reactors, how do you make microchips? How we use all this technology to help microelectronics industry? One question. The second one is, what do you do for cases where the testing is really difficult? Most of these guys here are working with reactors which are operating at 200 bars. A uh, kind of little mini reactor uh, to be nicely sealed and safe at 200 bars. Uh, what do you do? Because if you don't check it at 200 bars, you fail. You the give me a Very good questions. For the first question, I I'm sorry to say that uh, I, I have not tried to uh, look at the adaption of chemical chemistry and the tools that we've developed toward micro uh, chemical plants or micro analyzers, you know, the, the real micro chemistry that we're driving toward. So I haven't seen that bond uh, built yet. Regarding um, the difficult chemistries, you're absolutely correct. Combi has worked in pharmaceuticals and in homogeneous catalysis because of much simpler process conditions lower temperatures, lower pressures. Uh, the real challenge in heterogeneous catalysis is the very high temperature and the very high pressures. There's no question that CombiChem is not fully developed yet. I cannot reach 200 bar. I can come surprisingly close. Uh, I cannot reach, uh, well, let's see. The highest temperatures that I'm familiar with uh, on the commercial scale, I can reach in the Combi scale. So we have evolved the technology. It is, does not cover every single process or every single uh, pressure yet uh, or process variable yet, but we're getting there. And we think we see good engineering solutions. If you can seal it uh, at commercial conditions, why can't you seal it on a small scale? We think we can get there. The, yeah, it's a challenge. Yeah, big bolts and nuts and uh, things like this in the commercial scale. It, it, it's interesting. You disagree, probably. <laughs> but it's interesting. I don't know if you're familiar with the Duralock coupling. Very few people have heard about it. But this is a coupling that has no bolts, no seals, uh, and can hold hydrogen to 3,000 pounds. And the thickness of the connection is a pipe thickness, the wall of pipe wall. It's, it's brilliant. Uh, and the patent just ran out. So uh, it's amazing the uh, technology that's available. But I agree with you. It's, 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 we're not fully uh, developed yet, but I think there's a path forward where we can do a good job and cover the majority of the process. Yes, sir. Um, we always talk about the development triangle of a catalyst development uh, test synthesis, testing, and characterization. Um, yes. Does your uh, CAM tutorial system allow you to do uh, characterization to help understand the chemistry is above and beyond the performance? Very good. Uh, the question is if you look at the, the triangle catalyst prep, uh, <coughs> catalyst synthesis, and then uh, testing, and then catalyst assay, um, are the techniques, the tools, and the methods discovered by UOP and Syntep? Are they applicable? In fact, they are. When UOP uh, developed the technology, they developed three separate modules, material synthesis, catalyst prep, and reactor assay. Uh, material synthesis uh, can produce a wide range of materials. 
Catalyst prep is a little misleading because it takes those catalysts and can turn them, those materials, supports and turn them into catalysts. But they also have developed rapid testing, XRD, XRF, et cetera. 48 samples at a time, uh, less than three minutes a sample. Uh, a just tremendous step change in terms of the speed of analysis. Because to do all of the synthesis and then to have catalyst tests are great, but if you don't have the assay behind it, you can't complete your models. So the answer is yes, we have a tapped off three and we think we're very successful. And we exhaust all questions, right? That's the largest mm -hmm. number of questions I ever had in my life, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I do have to thank uh, our speaker for the great and inspiring <coughs> talk, and I think, uh, have to thank all of you for the great and interactive atmosphere. Thanks again for the great talk. Thank you.